Hello, people. I want to introduce you to Scott Bernstein, and uh, he's a mob historian, and he's uh, pretty well known. And uh, he's come here today to talk to me about a couple things and clear some stuff up. And uh, and it's going to be based pretty much on Gunnar Lindblom. And Gunnar's been on this show a few times, and Gunnar's going to be welcome back on this show. But sometimes things just got to be cleared up. Uh, statements were made on my show, and statements were made about Scott Bernstein. So Scott has been nice enough to, to come here and clear those up and we'll just clear the air. And that's pretty much it. This is not here. We're not here to bash Gunnar Lindblom. Okay, Scott, how you doing? Good. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I, again, I just want to state facts and clarify my position and kind of delineate a couple things that I've said in the past. Um, and just, again, just kind of set the record straight. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. A matter of fact, I appreciate you contacting me and letting me know that you did want to take care of this. Yeah. Unlike and, uh, Gunner on the interview you did with him, where he wanted to make very clear that you had reached out to him for the interview. I can make very clear that I reached out to you for this interview. I have no problem saying that. And now you have, uh, two, you have two things you uh, that I've noticed that you've written. One of them would be on the Detroit true crime chronicles. Yeah. I've, I've published six books. So six books all together. And then you, I also noticed you, you had white boy, Rick, you had that on there and it was sold out. And yeah, you well, my white boy, you know, honestly, my, the, the best piece of content for white boy, Rick would be the documentary um, that was on Netflix and it was uh, trending on Netflix for a good six weeks. It was in the top 10. At one point it was number four on the uh, overall algorithm for the entire, um, for the entire site uh, back in April of uh, 2021. So uh, that that's probably the the most accurate account of uh, Rick's case. I also worked on the Hollywood film with Matthew McConaughey, which uh, I I don't endorse, <laughs> despite the fact that I worked on it. But you you did have something to do with the Netflix special then. That was mine. I executive produced. That is yours. Okay. Uh, well, that's and uh, I noticed that you're out there. Is there any other work that you're currently doing that you wanted to talk about before we started? Uh, I'm working on the Stars Black Mafia Family Show. Um, we just finished the first season, uh, the scripted, we now have an unscripted eight part docuseries. that's going to be rolling out uh, later this spring where you hear the story from the real people, uh, including myself. And, uh, then I have a, a history channel, um, Jimmy Hoffa uh, project that will be coming out later this summer. So you're staying very busy. Yep. Okay. I'm going to put this up and I'm just going to get out. I don't know if it was on your end, but I could barely Sorry, hear God. any of that. Yeah, I couldn't barely hear. I could barely hear any of that. Okay, well, you know, then we're just gonna get to the piece, and hopefully, it will show up. You know, I'll play it separate probably on my when I do my next show. Now I got all my my uh, signal back. Okay, um, so pretty there's much a lot of uh, there's a lot of problems with that two minutes that you played. I mean, a that conversation never took place. Um, it's a fabrication. I never told him or agreed with him that his uh, great grandfather was Joe Toko. Um, and then he's conflating, or I didn't want to say conflating. He's just making stuff up. Uh, jo Joe Toko, I don't know where he got that from. Joe Toko was killed because he was having an affair with um, another gangster's wife. You know, that's totally false. We know exactly why Joe Toko was killed. Um, Joe Toko was killed because there was a beef with Tony Dana over uh, Ford Motor Company stock options. That's why he was killed. Uh, Tony Dana killed him. We know who killed him. Um, and Tony Dana would go on uh, to become a, you know, a force to be reckoned with in the Detroit mob for the next 50 years. Um, that murder was clearly sanctioned. Um, whether or not Black Bill Toko was uh, in Detroit or behind bars. Um, you know, there is some questions to be asked uh, how that happened. Um, what were the machinations behind that? But the notion that was put out in the Vlad interview where this is all coming from, um, that there was some type of ongoing animus in the decades that followed between Gunner's grandpa and Black Bill Toko over not avenging Joe Toko. I mean, that's just all false. And let me uh, ask you, now he's been doing this for a while. Why did you choose this moment to uh, talk about it? It's, it's things have just 
jump the shark, if you will. Um, it's been, you know, I've known him for five years. I consider, you know, Gunner is a, 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 you know, I'm friendly with him. I'm friends with him. Um, I have had meals with him. I've had conversations with him. Um, but this notion that he's like to put out there and create this narrative that I co-sign everything that he says and does, um, again, is is untrue. Uh, what I what I will co-sign about Gunner and what I said from the start, and I, I think I needed to be a little bit more um, concise in my wording, and this is where I wanted to you know make that delineation, is any co-signing of Gunner or endorsing of Gunner uh, was as a criminal. It was not as a mobster. Um, none of my reporting or my research has ever connected uh, Gunner Lindblom to any mob activity in Detroit related to Tony Giacalone or Jack Tocco or Tony Zerilli. Um, I can tell you what I know about his grandfather. Peter Paul Tocco was a produce guy. Um, Peter Paul Tocco was not a made guy, did not have a button. Um, Gunner's uncles, uh, Pete and Sal, were not made guys, did not have buttons. I don't even know anything about Pete and Sal's uncles. I've never heard anything about them. I don't know nothing about them. Uh, I know that Peter Paul Tocco um, was uh, uh, a member of the Holy Family Church, which is the church that all the, the big time uh, mob guys in Detroit, uh, they belong to. They, they actually built it back in the in the 20s. Um, I know that he was a World War II veteran that uh, was in a some type of Holy Family social club with other World War II veterans. Um, some of those World War II veterans were made guys. Um, you know, that's what I can say about so what, what you're Paul Tocco. Right. That, you know, the guy was was in the produce. He wasn't a made guy. I had heard that he might have ran a small book uh, out of his produce stand in Eastern Market. But trying to paint his grandfather as some big mafiosi or mafioso is it doesn't jive with anything that I've heard or reported. Uh, but I have, I, I never heard anyone say anything negative about Peter Paul Tocco. Uh, everyone liked him, but I had never heard anyone categorize him as a mobster or a mob figure or uh, anyone that was connected outside of that Holy family church community um, to the uh, Detroit mafia. So you're saying pretty much the Tocos were divided like a lot of families across the country, especially Italian families. And the part of the family that was not connected was who was who was Gunner. I'm saying family. that that Gunner came on your show and tried to expose their you know, there are a handful of Toco families, and they're all kind of under under this Detroit mob banner, and that's not true. You know, the Toco, you know, the name Toco is like at least in terms of that part of Sicily and Terracini and Palermo. I mean, that it's a very common name. I think he said there were two or three Toco families in Detroit. There are like 25 Toco families in Detroit. And to paint a brush across all of them saying they are all mob is just, it's, it's, uh, it's untrue. Um, I know a number of Tocos that aren't mob. Um, they have nothing to do with the mob. Uh, and, you know, it, it, this isn't really like a debatable thing. I mean, it's 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 genealogy. These people put up a, a a video that proves that if there is any relationship between the tocos that Gunner belongs to and the mob tocos, it's a very 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 distant relation. I mean, the, the video is saying that there's no relationship. I'm saying if there is any relationship in terms of cousins, it's it's incredibly uh, distant. So um, are you saying that the Toko family that put, they have something to do with putting this video up? Yes. I'm saying that's another thing I want to correct that. Uh, and I've expressed this to Gunner and he doesn't want to believe it, or this is not coming from a bunch of mob dweebs uh, or mob dorks, as he likes to call them uh, in their basement. You know, this particular iteration of um, people attacking Gunner's credibility uh, is, is coming from the Tocos and the Jackalones. And are there currently, are, 
ties with the Toco still in Detroit? You can answer that the best you want. Are there, what do you mean? I don't, I don't understand what you mean. Are they to Toco still the same? Are they, you know, are they still? The mob Tocos are still the same? Yes. I, and then, I like, and then, and then another thing he I said. I like to talk about active people. I'm just yeah, asking you that question. Yeah, I'll, but I have no problem talking. I mean, he's throwing the names out there. I'm not throwing them out. I'm just come after he throws them out. I'm just giving clarification and context. And another thing he said on your interview was um, trying to parallel uh, Peter Peter Toko, who they call Specs, um, or Black Pete or Blackie, um, that you know he's the same as as Specs Toko in terms of a familial relationship to Jack Toko and Black Bill Toko. Absolutely not. Peter Toko is a nephew of Jack Toko. Peter Toko's mother is Jack Toko's sister. There's no, there's no analogy between Gunner and Peter Specks Toko in, in this whole debate about Toko lineage. Um, he's come, he's come on my show and said that Jackaloni, he worked for, we did some things for him. That he lived across the street. Yeah. That he would, he actually did some work for the Tokos. Is that all fabricated? I, it's, it's nothing that I've ever found in my research or my reporting. It's nothing I would ever put my name to. Um, I have issues with some of the protocol and some of the time frames. Uh, I know that the Wikipedia page that I recently saw uh, claims that uh, Peter Peter Toko or Peter Paul Toko put Gunner quote unquote on record with Tony Giacalone. I mean, I could tell you that right now is not true. I mean, that never happened. So that's a false statement made on that Wikipedia. Well, page. It, it, if you're asking me, it is. Well, uh, you're a mob historian that knows these families very well. Yeah. I think if anybody would know, it would be you. Now, was Gunner a tough guy? Was Gunner a real hardcore criminal? You know, in the world of St. Clair Shores, teenagers and people in their young, tw uh, in their early 20s, back in the 90s, was he someone that uh, evoked fear? Yeah, yeah, he did. I mean, he was a, a cowboy um, running around the streets of St. Clair Shores and doing crazy things like home invasions and bank robberies and assaults. And I mean, that's all true. Uh, and he did 14 years in prison and kept his mouth shut. Again, that's all true. I have no problem right. for that. But so pretty, how did the I mean, Tokos right now, the family that he's saying he was part of, are they like kind of upset at him for? Yes. And this, another thing he goes on, he, he came on your show and he says um, at that festival a couple years back, that one of the Tokos came up to him and told him that they were proud of him and uh, they were they were they supported what he did. I can say unequivocally that is, I don't know who said that to him, but I can tell you that sentiment is false to a galactic degree. The the Tokos and the Jackalones are very very upset with uh, Gunner's behavior and uh, him co-opting their name for his brand and, you know, telling stories that they believe uh, are, are totally false. Um, and, and he's doing it kind of, not kind of, he's doing it without their permission. Um, and it's upsetting a lot, a lot of people. And I get a lot of the blowback. It's and I need, I need to come out here and tell people wh what I, what I co-sign, what I know and, and what I can't co-sign and what I uh, object to. Well, you have other mobsters out there, our informants, that are using him and saying these things also. I mean, are they? Well, I mean, explain, explain. I know what you mean. Uh, example, he was with currently, he was just recently with Larry Mazza. I was I was there. Yes. I mean, so is, is Larry Mazza going to step forward and say something about this? I can't, I can't speak for Larry Mazza. Is he aware of this right now? I can't. I, I don't know. I have no idea. So I'm guessing that he is, but I, I really, know. I don't know. I have no, okay. I'm not on a regular uh, contact basis with Larry. If I need to get a hold of Larry, I can call him. Um, I like Larry a lot. Uh, I respect Larry a lot, um, but I, I can't speak for him or, or uh, I know him and Gunner do a lot of things together uh, on YouTube and, and whatnot. I know Gunner just did an interview for uh, Larry's new thing on mob TV. Well, and I'm going to I'm going to be and doing I, a show today, and I got, you know, I know Plumbo people and stuff that basically say that Larry Maz is not real. So, well, I, you know, I can I can speak to that. Um, 
again, I think with Larry, you're kind of splitting hairs a little bit. Uh, the notion that Larry was a button or a capo, I don't agree with, but he was the equivalent of that. That's, you know, that's what my research tells me. Uh, but how can a street guy be the equivalent to a capo or? It, well, I, when I say, my, I, let me, let me back, let me backtrack for a second. Uh, when, when I say, I think he was the equivalent of a, a mob soldier even though I don't necessarily think he went through a making ceremony. I, I think uh, if it was, it was an un, a non-traditional one um, that I'm unaware of. Uh, but I, I've done quite a bit of research on Greg Scarpa uh, in addition to my interviews with Larry uh, because I'm um, working on a, 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 pro, a scripted project in Hollywood with some pretty major uh, uh, actors, producers, and directors that are deep diving Greg Scarpa. So I've had to do a lot of uh, deep diving myself. And yeah, I do believe there was a point in time at the end where Larry was helping, you know, Greg run that crew. Now, Greg wasn't officially a capo. Right. That's another thing. He was, again, he was kind of the, not kind of, he was the, he was equal to a capo, but he had never actually been made a capo, but he was the, 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 uh, the, the skipper, if you will, of the wimpy boys social club crew. What do you, let me ask you something. What do you think about all these informants right now at these shows? And a lot of them, and you're an historian, you know, when someone's BSing basically, yeah, yeah. and there's a lot of BSing going on here from all these informants. Yeah, and I, and that's why I don't, I don't really contribute or, or jump into the fray or honestly even want to comment on it. Cause everyone has their right to go out and make a living and, and try to create a brand for themselves and, and write a second chapter. The reason I'm jumping into this right now is because my name has been thrown out there way too often by Mr. Lindblom uh, over the last couple of years as some type of voucher or crutch or um, get out of jail free card. I, I don't know, but it, it has to stop. Uh, I've told him to, to stop mentioning my name in any of this stuff because um, I because I it's making me have to come out here and, um, you know, <laughs> break down the the truth amongst some of this fiction that is believed. people's feelings are going to be hurt after this is put up that's what it comes down to and and you know i feel bad about it too but well, don't bring my name don't bring my name into to your lies and and there no, no, no 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 i'm gonna put up the no here's what i'm, I'm not saying up. you lee i'm not saying you lee i'm saying when gunner goes on vlad which is a a, a huge YouTube platform exactly. and tells a giant lie and he can sit there and talk about whether or not you want to define it as a lie or a misinterpretation, or he says he, I mean, you should never assume anything and then go out and say it as fact. Uh, again, that's on him. But then when he tried to clean it up, he goes on these shows and he immediately says, well, Scott Bernstein told me that. And that's a fabrication. I mean, that that's a blatant lie. Um, I can, you know, again, I can talk about the Joe Toko murder extensively. And have I talked to, a, a, a with Gunner, I remember one time going on his show, um, and we did a Detroit mob, uh, murder timeline and that murder came up and I, and I said, what I'm going to say to you on, on this, Joe Toko was a, a, a very powerful Detroit mobster that ran the downriver region of Detroit. He, there's debate amongst historians about it, what his exact relation to Black Bill Toko was. Black Bill Toko was the founding father of the Detroit Mafia. Um, we know that they had some relationship. There's There were rumors that uh, they were cousins that had been brought up close, uh, had been brought up in the same household, um, possibly as brothers, but it's all it's all very foggy. Um, there's a, a wedding photo from 1922 uh, of uh, a Toko Zerilli wedding where Joe Toko was in a in a professional family photograph with Black Bill Toko uh, and Joe Zerilli. So it tells you from just that photo that there there was uh, some form of relationship there. Uh, Black Bill Toko went to prison in, in 1936 for tax evasion. And two years later, uh, Joe Toko was killed again by Tony Dana. Who would go on to become um, a capo uh, of the Down River region from from that area from that time in 1938 all the way till he died in 1984? Uh, Tony Dana was a um, de facto consigliere for probably 40, 50 years, um, 
a, a definition of a sleeper uh, and, and, a, and a powerhouse sleeper. Uh, and Tony Dana um, baptized Tony Zerilli. Uh literally and figuratively. He literally baptized him. He was his godfather um, when he was born. And it shows you how close Joe Zerilli was to ask Tony Dana to, to baptize his son. And then when Tony Zerilli got um, inducted into the Detroit Mafia in a ceremony in 1949, the common belief was that he was sponsored by his dad or his uncle, Black Bill Toko. He was sponsored by Tony Dana. So yeah. it just shows you that maybe in 1937, Tony Dana had more power than Joe, than Joe Toko. And, and that's why Tony Dana was allowed to kill Joe Toko. It had nothing to do with someone sleeping with someone else's wife, uh, wife uh, which came out in the Vlad interview and then has gotten spewed out in, in, in other things trying to clean this up. And that just had, had nothing to do with a woman. This had to do with the Ford Motor Company and the Detroit Mafia's control of Henry Ford and Harry Bennett and the, and the Ford Motor Company and, and who was going to benefit from from these uh from this relationship it specifically uh ford stock options how powerful nothing, was, nothing to do with a with a girlfriend how powerful was the detroit mob you'll have mobcasters get on here and mock the detroit mob yeah it's a joke the new yorkers I mean, it's a joke to think that someone would mock the detroit mob yeah and so it's kind of obvious when you have the motor companies and stuff there these families are very powerful so well not just that just look at it uh, you know geography and proximity to Canada, it, it makes yep. it so whether you're talking bootlegging during prohibition or narcotics post prohibition, um, you know, it, it becomes a, a nerve center for for uh, contraband, which makes the, the mobsters that control that city and control that nerve center. Um, it, it gives them quite a bit of weight and leverage. And do you think that um, let me get the, you got these podcasters on here that will like laugh about the Detroit mob. And a lot of this has to do with Gunnar Lindblom. They don't know what they're, they're talking about. Then. <laughs> and, but a lot of this has to do with Gunnar Lindblom. Well, and, Lindblom and, and if, I create, if I created that monster, uh, then I got to own some of that. And I know there was some early um, platforming I did for him uh, where I did refer to him as Detroit Mob Associate. And if I, um, I probably, that was a mischaracterization. That's a, big, that's a big mischaracterization when you think about it, though. Yeah, well, I'm I'm owning it now. I'm telling you, yeah. well, I, I, I posted I posted some of his um, fiction writings on my website, and when I posted it, I, I said this is coming from a former Detroit mob associate. And I probably shouldn't have done that, and that did give him some credibility uh, to start building his brand. And 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 frankly, it's it's gone haywire, and, and that's why I had to reel this back in and and make it very clear where I stand on this. Uh, and the leveraging of my name ha ha is stopping. And, right. and this belief that I'm having these intimate conversations with him and, and telling him these things uh, and, and confirming for him these narratives or endorsing them or giving them credibility, uh, it, it just couldn't be further from the truth. And I, I need to I need to state that. Have you ever gone hunting with him? No. But because he, he claims that. So he claims that I went hunting with him. Yes. Scott Bernstein. Yes. yes. So, <laughs> so, so, you know, everybody's buddies here. Hunting is where you guys all get together, it seems. Me? Like. You said that about me? Well, I can go back, I'm pretty sure. But, you know, just in case, maybe 10%. But I'm going to go back and check my... But I'm pretty sure that he used you in the hunting format. He used uh, Larry Mazza in the hunting format. He's never... And, I, I, I could be wrong. I don't think he's ever hunted with Larry. I mean, Larry lives in Florida. So Larry would have had to come up here. Well, then I think, and, and I can tell you, Larry, if Larry was in town, I would have known. Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of things I think that are being said here that aren't. Yeah. Really and I, and there's, a, there's just a couple more things that I want to clarify before okay. we finish. Um, he made a comment about in your interview about how if your family in the Detroit mob, you, you somehow get some free pass and you're allowed to out the rules or you know that again that couldn't be further from the truth um and i can give you a specific example to someone that he's talking about and he's talking about jack toko um jack toko killed his brother-in-law he jack toko made his wife a widow and made his nieces and nephews not 
be able to grow up with a father over a slight or a potential slight or a I believe it had to do with Jimmy Hoffa and Carl Licata, who was uh, Jack Tuckle's brother-in-law. I believe they killed Jimmy Hoffa at Licata's house. Licata tried to leverage that on the Toko brothers, and the Toko brothers killed him. So the belief that Gunner, at 19 or 20 years old, could have been going around and mouthing off, and he says this in, in your interview, that he was mouthing off to, to these, these uh, very powerful mob figures and there would be no repercussions because he was a toko because they liked his grandpa. You know, that he re, he he said something to me once about uh, Tony Zarelli. Again, this is him saying it that he was at some meeting with Tony Zarelli and made some comment to Tony Zarelli about, you know, the only thing separating me and you is this uh is this desk or whatever. Uh or this guy here, I guess there might have been some body. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, if you really said that, you don't know. You really said that, and, you th and you're telling people you got away with it. You don't know Tony Zerilli. And I'm not saying Tony Zerilli would have necessarily killed him, but he wouldn't have been walking out there uh, in one piece. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if he's ever talked to Tony Zerilli or met Tony Zerilli. I don't know if he's ever talked or met Tony Jacqueline. I don't know if he's ever met or talked to Jack Toko. These are stories that he wants to tell. That's on him. I have never came across anything in in my research and i've talked to everybody uh, almost every person that, that was around these people on a daily basis on both sides of the law um so if he was doing collections or bodyguarding or driving for any one of these people uh the people that i i've spoken to would know that and tell me that well he and, told and me that, he and that goes from the fbi agents that were following around tony jacqueline every day yeah. to the guys that were with tony jacqueline every day well, he said that he worked the doorways of clubs that were mobbed up as bouncer and stuff and that they purposely had him there. So, well, I, I, again, I can't speak to it. You know, he wants to say it. That's fine. That's on him. I, it's nothing that I can say or, or endorse. I'm going to ask you one final question. If there's anything you want to put on that list first, get that out. Well, yeah. And then I want to talk about he threw my name out again in his discussion about um, the, the Italian-American festival. Um, with an interaction that he had with Vinnie Giacalone. Um, and then he went on his own uh, Facebook page a couple days ago and posted something about Jackie Giacalone at that festival, watching him from afar and was in awe or was intrigued and recited some conversation that Jackie had with his wife it's just reckless behavior. And I know that got back to Jackie and it never happened. Um, Jackie Jackaloni is very mad at, it has been for five years about all this stuff that, that Gunner's doing and, and trying to uh, appropriate, or I guess in Jackie's mind, misappropriate the Jackaloni name. Uh, so the, the story that he put out there, I think he put it, I think he took it down after I told him like, dude, that this is not cool. Uh, that, that the boss of the Detroit Mafia was A, like co-signing what he was doing and was like uh, impressed by it or in awe of it. It's just, again, that's reckless behavior. That's reckless behavior that if you did it 30 years ago, it would be really reckless. Yeah. If you so, know what I mean. Uh, you know, there's, there's embellishing, there's the truth, and then there are, are flat out lies and... Uh, I just need to state what I know is fact, what I know is embellishment, and what I know is a lie. Okay. Any more and, questions? And, 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 and uh, you know, he, I don't know how he, – he, he said on your show that all these mob guys stopped by his, his tent. You know, I know Vinnie Jack stopped by his tent because I was there when Vinnie Jack stopped by his tent. I, but Vinnie Jack – ain't Jackie just because they're brothers. That don't mean that, uh, that the boss is, uh, somehow co-signing you. And just because Vinnie Jackaloni and his wife wanted to stop by and, and take a look, uh, and maybe grab a t-shirt by no means, does that mean they're co-signing you or endorsing you? Um, so, but I, I didn't like that. He threw that out there that like that Vinnie Jackaloni, that he's, telling people that Vinnie Jacqueline was shit talking me 
Um, which again, I, I, I completely own the fact that these people that I'm out there writing about and talking about, they don't like me. They wish I wasn't without around. A, without a doubt. So <laughs> the fact that Gunner somehow believes that he has some support from these people, again, it's just it's detached from the reality that I exist in. Um, but Vinny Jack again, he repeats this story, which I didn't want him to repeat. Vinny Jackaloni tells him, oh, I don't like Scott Bernstein. In fact, I threw a I threw a book at him once. This is Vinny Giacalone embellishing. Uh, Vinny Giacalone showed up at a book signing of mine. Uh, and he had some questions about some pictures of my book, specifically how I got family photos of the Giacalones um, in my book. I told him, I said, you know, the FBI um, subpoenas private photographers at, at mob weddings and anniversary parties and whatnot. And they gave them to me. There was no uh, negative words. Uh, exchanged he never never assaulted me never threw a book at me uh but i know that vinnie jackaloni in addition to telling some version of that story to gunner has told that to other people <laughs> and it's just like it's coming from all sides like the gangsters themselves are making up stories about me <laughs> so if you could put this all together basically if gunner's gonna watch this what can you say to Gunner right now? Just straight I, I'll, I'll call Gunner after this and tell him I did this. I mean, I told Gunner yesterday that I got to clean this up. You know, he's out there writing checks, you know, on my name that I'm not willing to cash because it's it's BS. Okay. So it's at a point now where you're going to throw my name in there and you're going to bring me into this fight in your mind as some type of ally. You know, I, again, I got to set the record straight. And this has been going on way too long. There's been probably five or six incidences where he throws my name out into some skirmish or 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 squabble or beef that he's having. And then I got to clean it up. So I just need to go public right now and, and let everyone know uh, where I stand. And like I said, I, I like Gunner. He's yep. a very colorful, funny guy. I've enjoyed spending a couple uh, dinners with him. Um, I respect his hustle. I think he's, uh, and I wouldn't have put that, writing of his on my website if I didn't think he was a talented writer. Um, but that that's where it ends. <laughs> I, I, I could not go out there and and endorse uh, some of these these tall tales and um, especially when they when they directly involve me and they're they're hitting my brand. I mean my brand is is history. And if you're telling people that I told you that your great grandpa was this mobster or this big time mob boss who got slain which in my opinion is you trying meaning gunner trying to connect his brand or his lineage even further closer to the the actual mob tocos and enhance his brand and then when he gets caught in that lie his knee jerk is to say well scott told me that wow i mean yeah. i was astounded by that because i would never say that why would i ever say something that that i know not to be true like, I, that's, so, that's one of those moments where your stomach goes up to your throat and you say, did yeah. he just say that? You know? Well, no, I knew that he got called out for that comment on Vlad. And I didn't think it had anything to do with me. Uh, and then I, I looked at your show and within a minute of your show opening, he's saying, well, Scott Burns, he told me that we agree. We agree. Like there was some type of like, we were doing group research together and we came to some consensus. Yeah. Uh, hey, so, well, Scott, I'm glad you said this to him. I'm, I'm going to put this out uh, probably tomorrow morning. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you one other question. I'm going to try to take advantage of you real quick while I got you here. Whatever you need, man. Who killed Jimmy Hoffa? Okay, so uh, I believe that it was a uh, three-man hit team, most likely consisting of uh, Vito, Billy Jack, Jackaloni, uh, Anthony, Tony, Pal, Palazzolo, and uh, Salvatore, Sally, Bugs, Bergulio. Uh, Palazzolo and Jackaloni were Detroit mobsters. Bergulio was a New Jersey mobster representing Tony Provenzano. Uh, I believe most likely uh, Tony Pal was driving the car. Billy Jackaloni was in the driver's seat and Sally Bugs was in the back seat. They picked uh, Hoffa up uh, at the Red Fox at about 2.45 in the afternoon on July 30th, 1975. Um, I believe they then took him, most likely they took him to Carlo Licata's house, uh, a button in the Detroit mob 
for mob historians, they would know Carl Licata as the son of Nick Licata, the, the godfather of the Los Angeles mafia. Um, there was a arranged marriage in the 1950s to squash a beef between Detroit and LA uh, crime families that had uh, emerged because of Nick Licata. And Black Bill Tocco married his daughter, Josephine, off to Nick Licata's son, Carlo. Carlo moved from LA to Detroit. And um, Carl Licata had a house that was on the west side. Um, and this is some of the other issues with, with Gunner uh, in terms of the Tony Jack stuff. Tony Jack, at this point in the 90s, was all the way on the west side. He was at 11 in Evergreen. Gunner grew up in St. Clair Shores, which was right. a half hour away from there. Um, just the logistics of that relationship don't make a ton of sense. Uh, so Tony Jack only needed a, a house that was close to his headquarters that he could do meetings at. Um, and Carl Licata, most of the Italians at that time and, and now live on the east side of Detroit. Um, the Jackalonis planted a flag on the west side uh, in the 70s, 60s, 70s, as a way to really, you know, get into the Jewish community. Right. Um, and that's where I kind of my connections with them popped up a little bit with my grandpa. Um, but uh, Carl Licata's house was uh, on the west side and it was secluded and it was uh, Tony Jack uh, was at the South Athletic Club every day. That was at 11 in Evergreen and uh, Licata's house was at about 17 miles. So it's about from 11 mile to 17 miles. So it's a six mile drive, but it's a straight shoot up telegraph road. It would have taken him 10, 15 minutes, not even probably. Uh, and he would take meetings there. And I know that he had met Jimmy Hoffa there on a number of occasions uh, in the years leading up to the disappearance. And um, I believe they took him to Licata's house under the, the roost that they were going to meet Tony Jackaloni and Tony Pro there for the sit down. He felt comfortable because Billy Jackaloni was in the car, who was Tony's brother and uh, a formidable capo in his own right. Sally Bugs was there because Sally Bugs represented Tony Pro, so it would make sense to, to Hoffa that that's where he was going. I believe they took him to Licata's house. They killed him at Licata's house. Um, and then there was a, a, a cleanup crew that I believe consisted of Detroit guys and New Jersey guys. And uh, they took the body, I believe, to Central Sanitation, uh, which would have been about a 25-minute drive from Makata's house. And Central Sanitation was owned by uh, the Corrado and Vitalis, which were uh, mob families and, and copper regimes. And I believe they incinerated him at Central Sanitation. Uh, I think in the set, 72 hours uh, after Hoffa disappeared, the FBI followed uh, Bazi Vitali, who owned Central Sanitation, to New York City to meet with uh, Genovese. I believe that meeting was to uh, inform them of what happened. And uh, then in less than a year, I believe, uh, Central Sanitation burned down in an arson fire before the FBI could get a, a search warrant. Wow. Okay. That's well, what I believe. And Tony well, Powell. Is Tony Powell's the real sleeper in this whole thing. His name really hadn't been mentioned until the last 10 years. Um, he was a, a, we can tie this all into, we can tie this all together. So uh, Joe Toko uh, ran down river. He was murdered in 1938. This is how we all started about, uh, started talking about this because Gunnar claimed that this was his great grandpa, but it's not. Joe Toko was murdered by Tony Dana. Tony Dana then took over down river and led down river from the late thirties all the way into the eighties. And then as, Reward for Tony Powell's work in the Hoffa murder, he was bequeathed Tony Dana's territory in 1984 uh, when Dana died, and Powell took over Down River and uh, ran the Down River area until he died about two years ago. And uh, Powell was able to uh, parlay his role in the Hoffa hit uh, all the way up the ladder from uh, Skipper to Capo to consigliere um and his name really never got mentioned in the narrative until the last 10 years and now we're at a point where uh the fbi uh firmly believes that uh tony powell was the person that killed jimmy hoffa where where did any of these guys that you're saying that were involved with the hoffa killing did any of them become informants no i asked that question because that's well, but no i shouldn't let me back up bugs very well might have been, and they killed him. 
So, you know, uh, Sally Boggs was murdered in 1978. He was on the verge of going on trial uh, for a, a murder from the 60s. He was killed in Little Italy. There was uh, some rumors that, that he was cooperating. Do you think that part of that has to do with he knew about Hoffa? I, yeah, I believe that the murder most likely um, got greenlit because of whatever information he, he could give up on, to, on Tony Pro uh, for the murder of, um, I'm blanking on the guy's name right now, but he was a union guy. Uh, three, Tony Three Fingers Castellito, I think his name was. Uh, it was a union guy back in New Jersey in the 60s. They were about to go on trial for that murder. Uh, but I feel like, you know, as they were most likely discussing the hit, they were like, we need to get rid of him because of this upcoming trial, but it also doesn't hurt to insulate ourselves even further from Hoffman. Well, you know, that's a fascinating uh, st story that you're telling about Hoffman because, one, it makes sense. I always believed it was done right by Detroit mob in that area. Yeah. It made, no one's going to put his car in a body and drive him to New Jersey. I right. mean, yes. and I'll be, on, I'll be on hand for the dig next month. Uh, so I'm, it's funny if you're paying attention to what's going on, there's this huge feud online between people that, uh, came up with the information to get the FBI to most likely go out and dig there next month. And they're all sitting right now on social media, going back and forth, fighting over credit for, you know, who's going to get credit from they dig up Jimmy Hoffa's body. And, and where I, are they going to dig it up? I, they're going to dig it up in New Jersey again? Yeah. They're going to dig in Jersey city, uh, in a place underneath the Pulaski skyway. Do the these Detroit. people understand that you're not going to drive in a car for 12 yeah. hours with a dead body? Right. Uh, so the Detroit the Detroit FBI and the New Jersey FBI uh, were out there in October. They did some ground penetrating radar, came across, I think, some stuff that had been told to them by some people. They want to run it up the flagpole. I think they're going to do at least a, a minor dig, if not a major dig. But I, I I am not confident that they'll find anything. Oh, use the taxpayers' money. Why right. not? You know, it's so oh. ridiculous. In fact, I can see them. I've told people about this, too. I can see them going out there next month. There's going to be all these cameras and that they find something. And then right away, there's going to be all these headlines that they found Jimmy Hoffa's body. But then after they do uh, a DNA analysis, it's going to come out that it's just some other guy that the Detroit, that the Jackaloni sent down to New Jersey Telling the Jersey guys that hey, this is Jimmy Hoffa, but in reality, it was some other dead guy, uh, as you know, a part of the subterfuge that was uh, so brilliant on the on the behalf of the Detroit mob, the telcos and the Jackalones of how they were able to get away with the Hoffa murder. That they just they put out this huge disinformation campaign and uh, told a hundred people a hundred different stories, muddied the water, muddied the water oh so God. much. The money that we're, sitting here, you seen. Yeah, we're sitting here 50 years later. And, and How many people have come forward and said that they know about it or who's involved in it? It's yeah, hundreds, hundreds. And it's always the most simple answer that's usually the answer. Yeah. That's about anything, anything in life. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll tell you, the Detroit family, <laughs> as offended as they are by Gunnar Lindblom, they're uh, equally, if not more, offended by the notion that uh, the Hoffa murder was somehow done on their territory but uh they were not the shot callers or they were the the uh, they were the uh the indians not the chief um that you know they're just like you think we needed help killing uh you know our own asset you think we needed some drunk irish guy from delaware to come in and do our house cleaning and, and, and when you when you really think about it though jimmy hoffa was killed for what reason what would you say was jimmy hoffa was killed well hubris i would say the first thing that comes to mind uh jimmy hoffa was killed because he wouldn't um retire uh, hoffa was desperately trying to get back in as president of the teamsters union and when the mob said that we're not going to let you become uh the president of the teamsters union again he started going on national television and making threats to these uh, mob figures telling uh everybody that he was going to get back into the presidency without the help of the mob which i believe he could have done because uh, he had such amazing and strong support from its rank and file, that he was going to get back into the presidency and he was going to cleanse the union of all mob influence, which meant cutting off this, the faucet of the, of, the, of the Teamsters Union Pension Fund, which uh, was a piggy bank for, for 30 years for mobsters to go out and take these huge hundreds of millions, of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars in low interest uh, loans to, to build... Uh, casinos and other uh, uh mob fronts to steal from um 
did his son ever have anything to do with his actual union? Yeah, his son became his son. And then this is a this is a story that doesn't get told enough. His son uh, got elected president of the Teamsters in 1996, and just stepped down uh, last year, the year before. His son cleaned up the union. His son went in there and and made amends for his father. His, his father came in there good, and he his father started with a good intent. Right. I, and I guess the son it's kind of ironic when you think about it. Yeah, the son came in there and and had a 25 year uh run as president of the Teamsters and it was immaculately sparkling clean. I think there might have been one or two indictments in that 20 years of any type of wrongdoing. And if you, you take it back the previous 20 years, there were indictments coming out every two months. When the son took over, was was the mob still fully involved or partially involved, would you say? I believe so. Uh, in the you mid-90s. think they got him in there and he kind of said, well... No, no, I don't think they got him in there at all. I think he got in there by himself. Do you think he came in with a little anger for what happened to his father? Yes. And that's a lot of reason for him. I think that played a role. That played a role in it. Yeah, that sounds like a hell of a movie. Come on, hey, but they've had, but they've made two movies on the subject, and neither of them were actually that good. The first one had a great performance by Jack Nichols, and he was outstanding as Hoffa. The movie wasn't great, and this last movie was just really um, historical blasphemy. So why don't you take something like this? It sounds like a fantastic movie, and present it. It's yeah, it's I'd love like, to. Yeah, it, I'd, it, I'd love to. It's well, that's what we're doing. Movie. We're doing that like, with, I'm doing that with the History Channel, so we're trying to set the record straight. Uh, me and Larry Fishburne. So, but just picture that you know, you got Hopper starting off great, then he downfall, the son grows up, yeah, the son never knows what happens to his dad, comes in and cleans up the very organization that wind up killing him. Yes, I mean, that is a, a really good story. I'd like to see you do something with that. I don't disagree. Well, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for coming on. And the Jimmy Hoffa thing is great because now i got to change my thumbnail and put Jimmy Hoffa solved. So, But uh, thank you so much. And any, you're welcome. Me, if you want me to come back on when, the, when they dig, let me know. I'll come back on. I can call oh, you. I would love it. I would love it. I like having you on. And uh, yeah. uh, you uh, just make my channel more legitimate having people like you. So thank I you I appreciate so you give, much. giving me the platform. I appreciate it. You take care of yourself. Thanks, my man. Okay, bye. Okay, people, that was a great story. Not only did we get the story on Gunnar Lindblom, we also got the story on Jimmy Hoffa. Two for the price of one. And I'm not going to put, I was going to talk about a little drama going on, but I'm not going to put it in this video because this video does not deserve that. I will do that on, on my live. Uh, and every once in a while on a live, my goal, I want to be more respected and I want to do a better presentation and do a better show. And there's people on here that are capable of doing better shows if they want to. We need to stop. If, my job is to go after the rats along with uh, Danny. That's what we're going to do. Bring on guys like Scott Bernstein. We will do lives and we do with our lives. They're going to be a little bit different. Uh, but, you know, when these videos get dropped, whether Danny and I are doing these videos or whether myself is doing these videos, we're going to give you top quality product. And um, guys like this coming on, it, it, Scott Bernstein had to make a decision about uh, a friend of his or someone he's friendly with. And we've heard Jimmy Calandra use that term, friendly. And we know what that means. And that means, eh, you know, we I know him. And uh, and Scott Bernstein was willing to come on and talk about it. And he's going to get some flack from uh, Gunner. Gunner's going to get a lot more flack than anybody. But I'm glad that he's given me the opportunity to put this out here. And um, you guys can do whatever you want with it. As for Jimmy Hoffa, there's been so many things from uh, Ray Mundy's dad killing him to the drunk Irishman. Uh, ridiculous things about putting the body in the car and driving it to New Jersey. It's the most logical answer, people. They don't do that with dead bodies. You don't put them in cars and drive them 12 miles, uh, 12, uh, 1,200 miles where a trooper could pull you over on the uh, state park uh, freeway. It just doesn't happen. And there's no reason to move a body. You are in Detroit. You have tons of areas. You have motor plants. You have burners everywhere. You got junkyards. You have, the, oh, you got uh, five lakes. 
you know, it doesn't make sense. The man was killed in Detroit. The man disappeared in Detroit. That was it. And they did it quick. And that's why they could never find Jimmy Hoffa because it was done so quick. That was it. Within two hours, Jimmy Hoffa was gone. The minute he got in that car, his life was done. Scott Bernstein, thank you so much for coming on and clearing that up. Gunner, you're still welcomed on the show. You're welcome to come back and discuss what has been discussed here today. You know, if you want to give your side, I gave you the opportunity last time, but you came on here and said a lot of things that didn't make any sense. And if you're pissing off the family that is running uh, Detroit right now, I think maybe you should chill a little, a little out. You know, you can only push your luck so far. Well, people, please sub to my channel. We'll have more people like Scott Bernstein on. Uh, and if you like it, like it, hit the bell. I'm just not good at talking about that. You know, people go out there, you know, putting the little sub signs up. I don't know how to do that shit. I'll learn. But anyway, you all take care. And I really hope that you people really appreciate this. Take care.